So I'm going to welcome everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Melinda Herzog. If you don't know me, I am the Healthy Communities Program Leader at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Ulster County, and I will be uh, one of your hosts for today's meeting. Uh, welcome today's March 11th, 2021 Healthy Ulster Council meeting. Um, so our other co-host, I'll let them introduce themselves. Vin. Hi, I'm, I'm Vin Martello. I'm Director of Community Health Relations for the Ulster County Department of Health and Mental Health, and I also direct the Opioid Prevention Strategy. And Katie? Hi, I'm Katie Sheehan-Lopez. I'm the SNEPED Nutrition Educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension. Thank you. So uh, at our Healthy Ulster Council meetings, uh, we generally get together, if this is your first meeting, for professional development, for networking, and for collective action. Um, and uh, today our meeting is on Zoom, so I'm just going to quickly, although now we're mostly Zoom experts, go over just a few basics. First and foremost, I want to let you know that today's meeting is being recorded and it will be available at healthyulstercounty.org on the community tab uh, a week or so after this meeting. And um, so if you have, you know, if you're shy about being in the recording, you can turn your video off, although I have to say we love to see your face. Um, so there's just a few quick things that you'll want to know. Of course, if you need to exit the screen up here, um, you can do that and then you can get back in by going down below to where the little camera is and that'll bring you back in. Um, you can choose how you want to see us by uh, splitting the screens and just seeing the speaker, or you can see everybody. And uh, there's also a chat box. And today, um, during the presentation part of the meeting, we'll be asking that uh, you keep yourself on silent and all questions will go in the chat um, until it's time for networking, where we'll let everybody have a chance to, to speak. But we've got a lot of people here today, and that's kind of how we're going to work. So be watching that chat box. And you can see who's at the meeting under the participants right here with this little uh, icon with all the people. And of course, this is where you can play with your audio, silence yourself, unsilence yourself, and your video over here. So um, just wanted to go over those few basics just in case you're still practicing. So again, if you haven't already, please do say hello by typing your name and your organization in the chat box. This is sort of our virtual sign-up sheet, but it also lets everybody else know who you are. Sometimes your screen doesn't have your full name and organization. So this gives a chance to let everyone know who you are and where you're from. Please stay muted throughout the presentations. You will be asked to ask your questions in the chat box and then when it's time for that, I will read them and the uh, presenter will get a chance to answer them. Um, this is today's agenda. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to really look it over, we've got a great lineup of presenters for professional development today. Tim Wiedemann will be here speaking on a people, uh, building a people-centered economy, a discussion about the Ulster 2040 report. And Madison Freeman uh, will also be here on Rural Health Network Wellness Programs. We'll have a stand up and stretch break on your own, a chance to do a quick evaluation form for us. And then we enter our uh, facilitated networking session where you're ready to present for just like a minute. You get a chance to share an upcoming program or something very specific about your organization. And then we'll close out the event. So I want to introduce Tim Wiedemann. He's the Director of Economic Development of Ulster County. And uh, Vin, could you please finish that introduction? Sure. Um, as, as the slide shows, um, Tim and his team recently created a, a, a report on the, uh, on the uh, economic development going forward. And as we've discussed many, many times before in, in this council and elsewhere, that, um, that economic uh, vitality and, and strength is inseparable from community health and wellness. We know that it, as we look across the board um, at chronic disease conditions, that um, families that have household incomes that are lower than $25,000 a year have significantly higher rates of chronic disease and premature death. And, and conversely, um, we know also that um, a healthy and strong economy is really dependent on, on, on community health and wellness as well, because a healthier community is a much more attractive place to grow a business in, start a business in, relocate to, 
raise a family. So that it's really the two sides of the same coin. And uh, to the extent that we can um, do both is really going to move Ulster County forward in a really great way. And without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Tim. Tim, welcome. We're really happy to have you here. Thanks, Vin. Thanks. Thanks, Vin. And thank, thanks, Melinda. Thanks for inviting me here. Can everybody see my screen? Great. So I'm going to spend about 10 or 15 minutes if I can do it quickly. And if I'm talking too fast, somebody just slow me down. But uh, I got a lot of ground to cover, but want to do it relatively quickly so we can have a discussion. Um, I think Vin set it up perfectly. Um, we've, uh, you know, the, the Office of Economic Development now, Department of Economic Development in Ulster County has, you know, been challenged over the years with what I think everybody now would recognize is a disconnect between economic development and the well-being of our people. And that was really a foundational principle that led us about a year ago when our new county executive, Pat Ryan, took office to reevaluate our economic development strategy. And so I'll, I'll dive right in with an image that actually the county executive chose when we were putting together a slide deck uh, for the uh, presentation that we do to the Rondout Valley Business Association. He liked the Jenga analogy. So um, the state of our economy right now is precarious. Um, it's precarious not just because of the pandemic that we're all still grappling with and our businesses are struggling to uh, respond to, but it's been that way for some time. I think we, we used a lot from existing reports as we were thinking about our strategy for economic development. One that I would encourage you all to be familiar with if you're not already is the United Way's ALICE report, which studies the financial hardships in our community for people who are asset limited, income constrained and employed. And so at, at times we've referred to that as the working poor, but I think this really unpacks that concept and really explains that we have a challenge in our communities throughout Ulster County and really throughout the Hudson Valley uh, where people who are, even people who are employed have a difficult time making ends meet. Um, and, and that was kind of a wake up call as, as the Alice report, um, I think they've been doing it for a while, but in 2018, it got a lot of attention as it was drawing uh, you know, significant attention to this challenge. Uh, just a little bit more recently, there was a report from one of our economic development partners at the regional level, um, the Hudson Valley Pattern for Progress called Out of Alignment. Uh, and this also raised some alarm bells about our economy in the region, stuff that, you know, I think, quite frankly, I feel sometimes like us in the economic development world are the last to catch on to things that everybody else already knew. So, for instance, uh, manufacturing has been uh, long touted as kind of the, 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 the preferred industry in communities because of the wages that come with those manufacturing jobs. But over the last three decades, manufacturing throughout the U.S. has struggled and has shrunk pretty uh, substantially. And here in the Hudson Valley, that's been pretty acute. And so this report really highlighted that uh, waning of the uh, old industrial and manufacturing businesses that once were the major employers in the Hudson Valley and the rise of the service sector economy, which again is nothing new, but I think uh, really the, the impacts of that are just really starting to be recognized in the, the, the world of economic development. Uh, and so the out of alignment report pointed to that challenge as well as, uh, uh, as shrinking population in our prime age cohort for entry level positions. So 18 to 34 year olds constantly over time have been choosing to leave this region either to go to college or to find more opportunity elsewhere. Um, that's created a, a strain on our workforce uh, here in the region. It also puts a strain on, you know, not surprisingly, on our school districts. Even as these are, you know, individuals that graduate out of our school system, their choice to leave puts uh, continued strain on the property tax values in our community and the ability to continue to support those school districts. So, you know, kind of compounding challenges that really led Hudson Valley Pattern for Progress to also raise an alarm bell about the combined increase in cost of living and the declining wages that people in our community have been experiencing over the years. Um, but all of that got even more complicated in the last year with COVID-19. And, and we had a group, uh, I think there's a slide in a minute, I'll quickly mention the folks that helped us think through this strategy. Um, that group met starting in September of 2019. And we had a bunch of really great meetings as we kind of grappled with what are the new challenges and how do they uh, influence the direction we want to take in our economic development work here in Ulster County. And then the pandemic hit. And so we took a break during that first wave in March, April, May, and June. Uh, reconvened the group in June and said, you know, do we think we need to start over, put this on hold? 
And the overwhelming response, which I think now in hindsight makes a lot of sense was no, 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 this just makes everything we've been talking about even more important. And, and I think we see that now as we're starting to emerge out of the pandemic in some ways, we're starting to see things like this K-shaped recovery that I think people have read articles and heard about where um, wage earners at the lowest wages have seen substantial hits in, in their wage earning potential during the pandemic. Luckily, buoyed to some extent by increased public subsidy and benefits from unemployment uh, and, and direct stimulus payments, but ultimately the wage earning potential of people at the lowest income brackets has declined significantly since the pandemic. Whereas folks at the higher wage levels have seen almost no decrease and in fact some increase in wages even in that time period since April of last year. Um, so, you know, I think this starts to set up just a, a reinforcing shot uh, across the bow of, of regions like uh, the Hudson Valley and Ulster County, where these challenges that we've been seeing over the last couple decades and that have really caused us to raise alarm bells in the last year or two just got a lot harder in the last year. Um, and in particular, I'll note that, you know, Ulster County is, is a... Uh, it's my home, I love this place, but it's in a weird kind of um, a fringe of a large metro area. It's, you know, I think we don't always think of it as rural. We uh, think of some parts of the county as maybe urban or suburban, but in the general sense of things, it's on the exurban uh, fringes of a major metro area. And those are areas that are most likely to be hit hardest during this recovery from the pandemic as larger firms that are generally located in major metro areas you know, sustain recoveries in those metro areas, the rural areas and the smaller firms in those rural areas are gonna to continue to struggle, especially as the, the, the stimulus that's been so prevalent during the pandemic wanes and, and we're left trying to figure out how we sustain an economy without that stimulus. So, you know, all of this really led to a, a kind of unifying theory of the group about what is the situation now and, and what we need to change, which really recognizes that over the last couple centuries, really, the whole uh, economy that we've built has achieved some tremendous gains. Uh, no doubt the quality of life has increased dramatically over those last couple hundreds of years. Wealth has increased dramatically. Now, life and expectancy and health outcomes have increased dramatically, but we're kind of at a tipping point where it's continuing to increase for some, but as that K-shaped recovery uh, exemplifies, there are people who are being left behind and increasingly that's unacceptable to us all. And we're recognizing that the negative impacts that that can have on our communities, on their health outcomes, as well as their economic outcomes. So enter our new economic development strategy, which you know I think is, is pretty high level. So I'm gonna say that a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today might seem a little lofty, um, but we're, we're hard at work this year to really drill it down to specific projects and initiatives. And I'll, I'll end the presentation talking about some of those, but would be eager to hear from you all if there are things that are already happening in your organizations that we should tap into or things that nobody's really paying attention to that you think we should. But the core thesis of our new strategy is to focus on a people-centered economy. We too often think of our economy as some abstract concept that has to do with businesses and industries and, uh, and you know, economic output or something like that. But really what it comes down to is that we have people who make our economy work. Those are business owners. Those are the employees at businesses. Those are the customers of businesses. Those are the communities that look to businesses to help improve quality of life. And ultimately, if we put the people at the center of our economy, that'll help us to achieve the kinds of universal goals in terms of equity, resilience, sustainability that we really need. So people are the engine of our economy and we need to rethink what the definition of success when it comes to economic development is. It's not about um, you know, supporting particular businesses. It's not even just about job creation. It's about making sure that all of those outcomes, be it job creation, wealth creation, income generation, new firms, attracting businesses, all are about improving the quality of life for all of our residents. And we need to engage in really more deliberate and targeted ways to accomplish that. It's a complicated system that I think for too long we've relied on the single metric of job creation as our ultimate goal. And while in some measures we may have done really well at that at times, it, it hasn't really scratched the surface of the bigger challenges and needs that our communities have. So the link at the bottom, I think it was also in the email invitation for today or in the PowerPoint that um, Linda has. Uh, this goes to our full report. It's about 40 pages. If anybody's looking for a little bit deeper dive in this, I encourage you to go check it out and, uh, and read through the report. I'm gonna give a quick two minute highlight reel and, uh, and then we can go to some questions and discussion. 
Um, these are the members of the group, uh, a really diverse group of folks from throughout the county, different backgrounds that I think represent a really non-traditional group of folks to help us with our economic development strategy, which I was excited by. We have so many great conversations that I think really shaped the thinking behind the report. Out of the report, we identified five major priority areas in order to achieve a more people-centered economy. Four of them we think of as industry targets, uh, areas that we wanna focus our attention to either grow or attract businesses in these industries. And those are agriculture, food and beverage, a tr traditional strength for us here in the Hudson Valley and in Elster County particularly. But we're looking at it not just as let's, you know, let's make uh, farming the, the, the thing that we focus on, it's farming, but then thinking about how farm products get produced into food products, and then thinking about how those food products get to market and, and trying to kind of work along that whole value chain to make sure that we're supporting each other in that, in that kind of chain from agricultural outputs to food on the table. Um, health, wellness, and care is obviously an important cluster for us for the reasons that Vin mentioned at the outset, but also just quite frankly, because it's one of our largest employers in the region. And so we look to it in a lot of ways for the jobs that we have in our communities and the hope that we can improve the quality of those jobs by paying higher wages. Um, climate and energy, which we've also referred to as clean energy in the environment, represents kind of an aspirational goal. We know that there's somewhere deep in our DNA as a community, a real, uh, a real passion for our environment and a, and a, and a value for the, you know, the natural places that make this place so special and the natural resources that make it special. And we know that there's a tension there because often those natural resources, the quickest and easiest way to make a buck is to exploit those natural resources. But we recognize that if we do that, we threaten the very quality of life that we have here. So that tension is always obvious, but what's not always so obvious is that there's also a lot of opportunity there. Um, one factoid that we learned during the process, the Hudson Valley has the highest density of water professionals in the country. Um, we have a watershed. Uh, I would argue, and I haven't been able to prove this definitively, but I think it's pretty logical that as a county, one of our largest exports is water. Uh, so when we think of economic development, we think of, oh, do we export widgets from a factory or, or what's our exports? Ours is water that goes down a pipe to New York City to the metro area. Um, and, and so I think that represents a real opportunity to think about how we conserve that resource, how we make wise use of it, how we uh, develop technologies that help other regions to sustain their water supplies as well. And then artists, makers, and creators is really just a clever trick to rename the manufacturing sector because I think a lot of people think of old, dirty manufacturing when they hear the word manufacturing. And they also think that it's quite frankly dead because every month, if you look at any of the labor statistics, every single month it feels like there's a decline in manufacturing jobs in our county. But what that hides is that there really is a kind of niche manufacturing that happens here um, that really has as a, co a common core the idea that people are passionate about making things, sometimes physical things, sometimes digital things, but we have a really, really passionate core of creative professionals and makers that, uh, that we wanna tap into that and make sure that they recognize how important they are to our economy and that we do everything we can to support them. And so those are the four sector-based approaches that we're gonna take to our economic development work. The fifth is a recognition that we also have to invest in social and economic infrastructure. We can't do this just by helping the businesses, employees, business owners around these four industries, but we also have to invest in things like housing, childcare, transportation, uh, and, uh, and other social and economic infrastructure that helps us to uh, achieve the broader goals of an equitable economic development strategy. And that means we need to focus on local ownership. We need to remember that local ownership matters. It keeps more in terms of economic outputs in our community. Um, and we want to support that. We also want to make sure that we're thinking, I mentioned this before, but not just about job creation, but about quality jobs, both in terms of the experience that workers have in those jobs, but ultimately in terms of how those jobs are able to support uh, and sustain uh, folks to live here in our communities. Um, economic development, just like, you know, I, I admire the Healthy Ulster Coalition because of the recognition that we can't do this alone. This has to be about partnership. And the same is true in a complex system like an economy. And so we know that we have to have partnerships as kind of the core basis for our work. Uh, and we also need to recognize that for too long, we've left out a, a large section of our communities, um, whether that's black and brown communities, whether that's women, whether that's uh, seniors, um, whether that's low income households, we tend to think of economic development uh, in way too narrow a sense in terms of who the stakeholders are and who we should be engaging, and we need to do a better job. 
So before I go to questions, I'm just going to quick throw up here some of the key things we're doing this year. Um, there's been some exciting announcements in the last couple of weeks, and there will be some more as we move uh, towards Earth Day. Um, the Green New Deal for Ulster County, the County Executive's State of the County Address, uh, mentioned a few things. Uh, we have a Green Careers Academy that we continue to expand to try to provide access to jobs in green fields, green technologies, green industries, green businesses. Um, we're also ramping up a program to recognize our business leaders who have committed to environmental goals called the Green Business Champions. Uh, so we'll recognize those businesses and help to grow the number of businesses who see um, environmental outcomes as a part of their bottom line. Um, we also are really focused on the healthcare workforce. And so this relates maybe directly to the Healthy Ulster County in several ways council in several ways. We, we've heard loud and clear and continue to hear that, especially during the pandemic, our health and wellness uh, employers have struggled to find people to fill open positions, people with the right credentials and backgrounds. And although we can't say we know a magic solution, I think it's time, far past time really, that we aligned our workforce system better with the healthcare uh, and uh, wellness uh, employers in our community and find ways to make sure that we build the uh, talent pipeline that those employers need. Um, I mentioned the kind of value added production approach that we're taking with agriculture, food and beverage, really working not necessarily, uh, you know, specifically and on supporting farms or food, food manufacturers, but trying to bring them together to make sure that we're getting the most out of the outputs from our farms and that they uh, are able to produce greater value for those farms so that those farms can sustain their work. Um, we're creating uh, a couple of manufacturing hubs um, throughout the county, and I'll talk about one in a moment here that's exciting to me. Uh, and then also really trying to double down on our commitment to meeting uh, people where they are in their local communities, the towns and villages throughout the county to work with them on economic development. The, the most exciting thing that I'm working on these days right now is the reimagining of our former IBM campus in the town of Ulster. So uh, for 25 years, this property that used to be IBM's uh, local headquarters um, has sat vacant. Uh, the county has now acquired two properties on the west side of the campus due to unpaid taxes, and we're in the process of redeveloping those properties. I can go into a lot more detail, but the vision here is to kind of create an intersection of our makers and creators, providing space for small manufacturers who can work together and, uh, and build community together in a space, and also with our agriculture and food processors, so that those two kind of dynamic elements of our creative economy can kind of find a common home in one place and, and some interesting synergies can develop from that. Um, just a quick image of some of the expressions of interest that have come in in the last week. Uh, in the foreground is a group of artists and musicians in the Kingston area called Blueprint that have proposed to use the second floor of one of the old IBM buildings for small workshops and studios for artists and musicians at relatively low cost, given that cost increases uh, have caused artists to struggle to find space to do their uh, to do their art and to make their products. And so uh, using some of that space for that. And in the background, a local food processor called FarmBridge. Uh, it's been looking to expand for years and hasn't been able to find a space. And so we're, we're hoping that there'll be a space for them in these buildings. Final thing, um, our website, the URL is kind of long, so pardon that. But um, you can go there to get more information about any of this stuff. In particular, there's a link to sign up to join our discussion. Uh, it'll ask you some questions about whether you're related to a business. And if so, is there one of these sectors that we're focused on that you feel most aligns with your business? Uh, and then this will be our mechanism for gathering folks in conversation in the second quarter of 2021 to talk more about the specific tasks and projects that we can undertake to help achieve the goals in each of those clusters. Um, I think that's it, yep. I talked fast and I still managed to take up 25 minutes. So I apologize, but hope we can have some time for some questions. Yeah, I'm just going to point out that I did see one question already. And I'll remind everyone, um, if you do have a question for Tim, please type it in the chat. Um, Barbara asked about housing in the diagram that you had and uh, how that fits in. Yeah, that we see that as part of that social and economic infrastructure. Housing is such a critical component. And I think, you know, the county has struggled for a long time to figure out what role it can play in the housing challenge. That's not really a new challenge in most ways. Um, but we are specifically doing one thing, which is to repurpose the old county jail as workforce housing. So we're working through that right now. We have a developer and it's, I think, nearing the conclusion of a design process to design that and then to move forward with constructing uh, workforce housing. 
and then also engaging with local communities to really say, look, ultimately we, we don't have as much housing as we really need because housing is very expensive to build here. And one of the challenges that makes it expensive is that most communities find it hard to agree where they would allow housing to be developed. And so we have to have that conversation. It's a hard conversation. Often people don't want it developed in their backyard. There's a name for that. Uh, and, uh, and we have to get over that and find a way to understand that all of us benefit from having enough housing to make sure that the people who work in our, our local businesses have a place to live. Um, so I have another question about where does tourism, ecotourism, and the Mid-Hudson Valley as a premier destination come in? Yeah, so it's a common question because we didn't address it specifically in the economic development strategy. Um, we have a Department of Tourism. We are fortunate to be located in a place, both the proximity to New York City and the geographic and kind of physical beauty of this place makes it easy for us to win at tourism. And we've won in many ways over the years. I think we've got challenges obviously to address during the pandemic. Our tourism and hospitality businesses have been hit very hard and our tourism office is doing uh, yeoman's work trying to make sure that we access all the funding support that we can to support them to recover from the pandemic. But I think this strategy is really about all the other things that we need to focus on to make sure we have a diverse economy here. Um, and so we've, we certainly work together closely with our tourism office and expect that we'll continue to have more discussion about how to fit tourism in here. But I will say explicitly that our ag food and beverage cluster has a tourism dimension. Obviously, agritourism is a, an important part of our tourism economy. Our makers and creators cluster also has an interesting tourism angle as people do come here to experience, you know, the both the food manufacturing, but also um, other manufacturing, niche manufacturing here and to purchase those products. And then obviously the health, wellness and care cluster that we identified also has a tourism dimension. People come here in order to uh, visit wellness providers or find that an important part of their experience while they're here. Um, so I don't Oh, I do have another uh, comment in the chat from Vin. It's great that the plan's building on Ulster County's unique assets, economic development, not a one size all fits all proposition. Are we strengthening the mechanisms and supports that help entrepreneurs transition from a good idea to a viable business? Yeah, that's, that's one of our focus areas, especially in a couple of the clusters in the ag and food and the makers and creators cluster. That's an important strategy. A lot of these businesses, a lot of our businesses in Ulster County are micro enterprises under 20 employees. Uh, many of them are sole proprietors and kind of, you know, looking to either add their first employee or grow from there. Um, and so we have a lot of partnerships with organizations like the Mid-Hudson SBDC Small Business Development Center that helps with that kind of uh, growth strategy that some of these businesses have. We're also fortunate to have a couple of incubators and accelerators at our local colleges and in other local institutions that help us with that. But it is, it's such a critical piece of this. We're not, I think, geared towards trying to attract a 500 person or 1000 person company, what we're really trying to do is to help those two or three person companies become 10 or 12 or 20 person companies. And, and that is about providing those entrepreneurial supports. Great, um, I have a question from Kathy Nolan. Are there ways to bring our educational institutions from colleges on down into these conversations? Hi, Kathy, long time no see. Yes. Um, in fact, I'm working on uh, a contract right now with someone to do an inventory and assessment of exactly that, looking at, in particular, in this green economy side of the equation, um, looking at what are the skill sets that are required for the occupations that consider we consider to be a part of that cluster, and then how do we make sure our educational and workforce partners are aligned to provide those skill sets. Um, and I think that's a key challenge. It's one that came up in a couple of really um, focused conversations with the Ulster 2040 working group that um, you know we may, we may still need some help trying to figure out how to even approach that challenge because our educational and workforce systems are big behemoths that are kind of geared in the way that they're geared and trying to change direction for those organizations and institutions is obviously challenging, but I think we're all in alignment that we need to do it more. So I get to ask one question just because I have one. Um, and that would really be, we all know that, you know, a high speed internet really has a lot to do with uh, economic development. And clearly this year, like no other has underscored how many people and areas are without it. Um, are there plans to address that? 
Yeah, so um, this is part of, again, that social and economic infrastructure. Um, the county has been, you know, kind of banging its head against this challenge for a long time. This is a, a county that's immense in geographic size with pockets that are very rural, where traditional approaches to providing access to broadband are really unrealistic, as evidenced by the fact that even after $500 million or something like that, that the governor invested over a couple of years to try to expand broadband, it really had very little impact on the quality and speed of connections in our rural areas in Ulster County. So um, I'm encouraged to see that there's expanded funding opportunities in the relief bill that just passed through Congress related to broadband. I think that'll provide us with right, really quite frankly, the resources that are needed to try to tackle this challenge. There's also new technologies that might be helpful in this arena. So wireless technologies that might be a solution for getting the high-speed broadband to rural parts of our county. So we're continuing to evaluate the right way to approach it and the funding that might come through in the relief bill would, would help to a great extent, but we recognize the challenge. Um, we have uh, just a couple of last questions here and these will be the final ones. Uh, one from Marge Gagnon, how are we including the Hudson Valley Center for Veteran Reintegration in this plan? That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think the natural way that we have normally included them in our work is to think of that as part of our workforce development system. And so making sure that we engage with them to understand what are the employment opportunities that we can provide to veterans, um, and then how do we support them to be successful in those employment opportunities. I would say that this is an area that kind of maybe relates more to the Healthy Ulster Council and to all of you and your organizations. You know, I think the intersection here with the necessary mental health supports and physical health supports that some of our populations need more attention on uh, is one that we haven't spent a lot of time exploring, honestly. You know, this is something where, you know, we need to make sure that people are able to, uh, to get to work transportation wise, that are able to get care for their kids, obviously. But I think we don't think often enough about what, how are we creating accessible workplaces that make it possible for people to re-enter the workforce, either you know, coming back from the military or coming out of prison. You know, these are important steps that I think we're just at the beginning of, but would certainly appreciate ideas, thoughts, partnerships with you all to help explore that further. further. Thank you. And our final question um, on the topic of infrastructure, this comes from Marcia Sebro. You mentioned transportation. What would that look like? <laughs> Challenging. Uh, you know, again, just like with the broadband, our rural county makes it really hard to find ways to get people from where they live to where they work. Um, you know, th there's an interesting opportunity with broadband to make it unnecessary always to travel, especially as more and more employers are recognizing that. Uh, jobs they never thought could be done remotely can actually be done remotely. Uh, but I think we'll always still have a challenge around getting people physically from one place to another in a large county like this. We've explored partnership opportunities with um, uh, ride share companies that may be able to provide last mile service to rural parts of our county. Obviously resources are the major challenge here. Our UCAT transit operator is mostly federally funded. Um, we just don't have a lot of county resources to fund transportation. Um, but I think we're interested in exploring that further and trying to figure out if there are some cost savings that we could actually get out of our transit system if we redesign it a little bit better to serve those rural areas. Um, so again, though, you know, looking obviously interested in partnership there, if there are employers who are willing to help pitch in for the cost of, of a transit route or some other transportation solution, that could go a long way to trying to provide greater access to people. So we're always eager to talk more about that. Thank you. Well, Tim, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, you know, uh, this isn't my first time seeing this and I'm still learning new things. This is really exciting. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I'd like to uh, just go back to uh, our guiding our guiding document here just to see where we are. Um, let me just share. And we're gonna move on to our next presentation. Um, I'd like to introduce Madison Freeman. She's the program coordinator at the Ellenville Regional Hospital um, at the Ellenville Rural Health Network. And she'll be sharing with you all of the programs, the Rural Health Network Wellness Program. So I'm going to uh, give her a chance to set up and welcome Madison. Hello, everyone. Give me a second while I go ahead and share this. 
Yeah, and it gives everybody a chance. Uh, if you have any last minute thoughts for Tim, type them in the chat. And thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate you joining us today. If you're able to stay, we would love to have you. Um, I think Madison's going to have a lot to share on Ellenville Regional Hospital. Exciting stuff. So. Yeah. We can see your presentation, so you are good awesome. to go, Madison. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, as Melinda said, uh, my name is Madison. I am the new program coordinator for the wellness programs here at LMU Regional Hospital, the Rural Health Network. I'm just gonna give you a, a brief overview of the different population health and chronic disease programs we offer. Um, and let me know if you have any questions in the chat and I'd be happy to answer anything I can. So for those of you who don't know, uh, our partner organization, as I said, the Regional Hospital, it is a 25 bed rural critical access hospital and a teaching facility. Um, we do service, majority of the service um, population is from the town of Wawersing a rural town that serves a medically underserved population, federally designated. Additional information about the Wilworsing community. As most of you know, I'm sure you're kind of mostly familiar with the geog uh, geography of the area. But if not, we do also have some data regarding some of the other social determinants of health that impact our population specifically, uh, including the income poverty ratios, uh, as Tim previously mentioned, the asset limited income constrained and employed population um, he did go over that kind of a little bit briefly, but for our population specifically, that is 23% uh, of our population. Um, another staggering number is that 20% of the residents in our area um, over the age of 25 have less than a high school diploma. I just wanted to go over that a little bit briefly because it kind of all goes into um, the different things that impact the health of our population and why we came to be who we are. So for the creation of the Rural Health Network in general, um, this was created from a consortium of the Institute for Family Health, the Regional Hospital, and the Ulster County Department of Health and Mental Health. Um, in 2017, when the hospital decided to lead the charge on writing a grant for the Network Development Planning Grant um, from HRSA, and it was the first grant that our network received. So after a year of planning, we decided to jump ahead and start programming. Um, and the first program we started and the kind of basis for our programmatic efforts is the Healthy Hearts Program. This was uh, received through funding from the Rural Healthcare Services Outreach Grant Program uh, through a health improvement special project in 2018. And the goal of the Healthy Heart Program and the goal for the majority of the basis of our network was to reduce the incidence of cardiovascular disease through both early identification of at-risk population as well as through provision of preventative services such as nutrition, education, health education, uh, physical activity, and other lifestyle changes. And to do this, we utilize a community health worker model. So why do we specifically focus on cardiovascular disease? Um, I'm sure a majority of you guys understand that cardiovascular disease in our area is a prevalent issue. I do have some uh, facts here for specific to the Wilworsing community. For our age-adjusted ER rate, it is 16 per 10,000 which is uh, both three times higher from Ulster County as well as four times higher than New York State. Similarly, our ER rate for hypertension is 47.1, um, which is two times higher than the county as well as the state levels. So the Healthy Heart Project, uh, just to outline some of the objectives we initially outlined um, that we currently work on and just the project in general, this again starting in 2018, we are gonna be ending this grant in April, uh, of 2021, uh, just to mention that, but we are continuing with the cohort. But the basis of the cohort itself, uh, we wanted to recruit 150 individuals within our community that were within that target population, which I will discuss a little bit more, to participate in a community health worker cohort. With those cohort members, in addition to working with community health workers specifically, we hope to link them to wellness groups, classes, social supports, uh, community events within our area, um, and additionally, in, in addition to the 150 cohort members, we hope to engage at least 200 community residents in these kinds of ongoing community events. Um, the idea is that we also wanna, we wanna show our presence. We wanna help link them to all the social supports that they might need to mitigate the, their specific health issues. Um, and also to build our network of partners and organizations that are servicing our population. In terms of capacity for clinical service staff, as well as kind of mitigating issues associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Uh, we hoped to provide training for the staff here at the hospital, as well as the Institute on best practice, uh, practices for cardiovascular disease, 
as well as other best practices such as motivational interviewing, uh, mental health um, first aid, things of that nature. And similarly, we wanted to integrate, uh, develop integrated workflows between the staff here as well as the staff at the Institute. That way we are kind of supporting care coordination and streamline uh, risk uh, address, addressing risks for those patients. Okay, so the target population uh, for, for these, this cohort specifically are individuals between the age of 35 and 70. Uh, in our region, uh, it does say here the Wawarsing region, but we do um, service 10 separate zip codes. So we go into a little bit of Orange County in the Wurtsboro era, area, as well as down into Pine Bush. Um, so we do service a large rural community specifically um, who are at risk of developing cardiovascular disease, but do not have a diagnosed CDD. Um, and at this, I just want to touch upon a little bit. Uh, this was criteria specifically for the Healthy Hearts Program, but with additional funding currently, our eligibility criteria is for those with uh, heart abnormal or abnormalities has kind of been a little uh, is less strict. Um, so we are looking to include more participants in the cohort to kind of address the uh, broader, like broader chronic disease risk. Um, but the risk factors were looking for now and we previously looked for were smoking status, uh, those with a high BMI or weight, um, hypertension, a family history of heart disease, a diagnosis of diabetes and or diagnosis of prediabetes. So we talk about the adult cohort. Um, so from this, we decided we kind of wanted to expand. And so we created a family wellness program as well to enlist a cohort of families with children between the ages of five and 13 that are at risk of obesity. Um, this was funded initially through a fund for women and children back in 2019, uh, but we got additional funding this July through a uh, network development grant to expand that program. Again, we utilize a community health worker model. So we have community health workers addressing just the family cohort as well as one addressing just the healthy hearts cohort, um, utilizing a family approach to healthy behavior change with the idea that if we are addressing the risk factors and the behaviors within the parents and we're engaging them specifically, there's gonna be a downstream effect onto the children. So we touched on why we address cardiovascular disease. Um, so why are we addressing childhood obesity? Uh, we obviously saw another increased need within our community specifically. Here we sh uh, I'm showing kind of the Ulster County rates. We have obviously higher rates in Ulster County as compared to the majority of the Mid-Hudson Valley um, in obesity and overweight status within elementary school children. So you see on the right, that's also the um, status of overweight and obesity in Ulster, uh, Orange County, Ulster County, all the counties in New York. Here I show some um, data specific to the Ellenville uh, School, which is a school that we primarily service. Uh, we have some 2015 compared to some 2018 data. It shows here that in 2018, there was lower rates for females and males respectively um, in, of obesity. However, our health center data is showing that we do continue to have high rates of obesity within youth under the age of 18 with a uh, obesity rate of 26% in 2018. So it's still a prevalent issue that needs to be addressed. So how we hope to address that. Um, the project objectives here for the family wellness program, again, a 36 month project period. We um, initially, uh, since this is a network development grant, one of the major things that we're doing is we're conducting a community health needs assessment and a subsequent gap analysis. So we're looking to see what services are the families that we're servicing and the majority of the net, um, population we're servicing missing. Um, where are those gaps that we're seeing? The idea is that once we identify them, we'll be able to recruit additional community agencies through networking such as this to fill those gaps and identify needs within our population. We also hope to enroll 90 families into the comprehensive obesity reduction program and an additional 300 individuals uh, engaged in ongoing programming. Specifically, we actually are working with Cornell um, through the FNEP classes. We are partnering with Planned Parenthood for a secondary objective of addressing sexual education programming and teen pregnancy rates here. Um, we wanna hold gardening education classes. And then a final uh, activity that we are doing, which is pretty cool in my opinion, is a healthy restaurant initiative. This has been put on hold, obviously with COVID and a lot of area restaurants being um, closed for the time being, but the idea is that we're gonna be recruiting area restaurants to kind of do an evaluation of their current menu offerings, specifically towards children, 
the idea that our nutritionist um, is going to go in and provide them with cost effective alternatives, the idea being that there would be healthier options available to youth and adolescents on their menus and improve eating patterns within our community. Eligibility criteria for this cohort. So we are looking for families with children between the ages of five and 13. Um, I will say that they should be within the ages of five and 13 at the end of our grant period. Um, so if they are at this time, three years old in two years, they will be within that uh, age limit. And we are looking for those that are at risk of obesity. This is uh, purposefully vague, I will say, because we are hoping, again, this is a preventative wellness program. So we wanna get as many families involved within the area as possible. So this kind of uh, criteria and eligibility is at the discretion of the providers making the referrals. Uh, but I did list out here some of the different things that can be looked at to determine risk, such as if the child is already overweight, um, if the parents are categorically overweight or obese, if they have comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, tobacco use, things of that nature. And if you are seeing there are like obesogenic behaviors such as unhealthy eating patterns, sedentary behavior and lack of physical activity, they would all be eligible for the program. I also just wanna to touch upon current demographics uh, for our cohorts. Um, previously, I did say we were hoping to engage uh, enroll 150 people into the adult cohort and we did surpass that number. We are at 165 at this time, which was very exciting. Um, some of the uh, different clinical measures. So we have an average age of 55 and a half, uh, 0.4, but the average heart age, um, which is based on the uh, CDC heart age calculator is 68.8, making the age difference between actual and heart age to be 14.7 among our cohort members. Um, we do have an average 10 year risk of developing a heart attack or stroke of 17.4% and a BMI of 34.3, which would be categorically obese. Some other stats um, just touch on a we have 21.7, uh, 21.0% of our participants uh, have a diagnosis of diabetes, 56% have hypertension, and then 43% use tobacco. Uh, family cohort demographics currently have 29 families and 87 individuals. We are hoping to get up to 90 by the end of the grant period, but I don't foresee that being an issue at this time. Average age of 24, seeing that uh, we are including children in that number but we do also still have an average BMI of 34.3. Additional family cohort demographics. I don't, these aren't as um, measurable seeing that diabetes, uh, hypertension, tobacco use are also including children within those levels. So it won't, it's gonna be lower than within our uh, adult cohort. Okay, so now that I've talked about the different cohorts, uh, what do we offer these participants? As I previously mentioned, we do utilize a community health worker model, uh, meaning that once we are given the referral and we have, uh, we call the consumer and we, they agree to be in the cohort, we sign the consents and then the community health worker will work with them to develop an individualized action plan for behavior change, um, specific to the behaviors that they are, they were deemed to be at risk, uh, whether that be weight status, tobacco uh, use, things of that nature, we develop short-term long-term goals as well as the individual action steps that need to be taken to achieve those goals. Um, in the same method, we utilize a nutritionist. So we have a nutritionist working with these cohort members if they are um, requested to kind of work towards individualized goals and have individual consultations with them to address the specific needs of those consumers. And then I'll touch upon each of these additional offerings. So one thing that's very cool um, clinically that we have through an additional grant funding is we are offering free calcium scoring to participants. Uh, they don't need to be within our cohort. They just need to be given a prescription from their primary care provider. And what this is, um, these are for participants that have a significant family history of heart attack or stroke, um, a heart age that is 10 years older than their age, and then a 15% or higher risk of heart attack or stroke in the next 10 years. And this is just one of those clinical things that can be utilized to determine severe risk of a uh, heart attack or stroke. And then the carotid ultrasound also has the same eligibility criteria as well as if they had a recent stroke, um, if they have coronary artery disease, if they have an abnormal sound in their carotid arteries um, based on a provider's 
uh, use of stethoscope. Um, and then again, the heart age and the percent risk of heart attack or stroke. Additionally, we have this cardiac uh, wellness prehab program. So what this is, um, is a two, uh, it consists of two aerobic classes a week um, for a total of four months, uh, consisting of 32 total visits with a, the physical therapy department here at the hospital. So what happens is a participant signs up, they do an initial evaluation with the physical therapist. And from that point on, they are doing evaluations every eight weeks um, after, in addition to these two aerobic classes per week. And then they, after the uh, 32 visits, they do a final post evaluation. The idea being that with increased aerobic uh, exercise, it'll decrease the risk of overall disease incidence and improve their health. So they would be um, eligible if they have a current smoking status, BMI over 25, hypertension, or a diabetes diagnosis. In addition, um, to all of those things that we offer uh, and how we get our community engagement of more than 300 people in the last three years. Uh, we offer a multitude of free programs and classes. Uh, I will say a lot of these things have either been transferred to virtual or they are on hold with COVID and or the winter, <laughs> but we do offer a lot of things and we're continuing to offer more as ideas come and uh, partnerships develop. One of our most popular ones that I'll touch on a little bit more in a second is a pharmacy. Um, which we are actually having today. So that's exciting. Uh, we are offering the FNEP classes and cooking classes with Cornell Cooperative Extension to families, caregivers, and broader consumer, uh, consumers. We do New Horizons educational programs with partner organizations for seniors, so specific senior issues. We did partner with Hudson Valley Hospice last month to discuss um, hospice uh, options within the Hudson Valley and for our participants. We do a multitude of physical activity programs and classes utilizing our physical therapy department. We have someone doing chair yoga. Uh, they've done flexibility classes for seniors. They've done series for youth. Um, we previously also did a series of classes that we provided to the Ellenville Center, um, the Ellenville School District for uh, the gym teachers usage as they were kind of being limited on what they could be offering their children virtually. We are again partnering with Planned Parenthood for sex education classes. We do line dancing classes when the times allow it, which are quite fun. Gardening education classes, things of that nature. And then we also currently have an MSW intern that is providing mental health counseling to any participants that request it to no cost to them. And I will say again, none of our programs, classes or any of the services I previously offer, um, discussed are billable. They're all free, no cost to participants. Like I said, um, the pharmacy is definitely our most popular program. And today we are offering at four to six. This is the way that things used to go and the way it was previously offered. Um, it's a free farm stand. Uh, there are no income requirements. Anyone can come. Um, all that we ask is that you give us your information for reporting purposes. Um, but at this time we're doing at the back of the hospital, participants drive down, we give them a free bag of food. Um, and it just consists of whatever we are given. And this is in partnership with the Community Action of Ulster County, as well as the Hudson Valley Food Bank. And of another very popular program um, and something that we get a lot of feedback about is the weekly meal circular packets that are given by our nutritionist here at the Rural Health Network. And what this is, is through ShopRite every week, there is a circular that provides the on-sale items of that week. And our nutritionist takes those, she creates a shopping list and an uh, ingredient list and a recipe book for participants so they can utilize what's on sale to create a healthy as well as um, cost effective meal plan for their week. And this is provided to cohort members and also shared on our Facebook nutrition support group that she runs and by request if participants for request it. Some other things to note, um, solutions to different problems we've had. Uh, Referral cards, referrals were becoming kind of difficult for us for a little bit and currently we're in a little bit of a stagnant place because of uh, COVID. But these are the refer referral cards we previously used. We found that yellow paper stood out more <laughs> and was more likely for uh, ER staff to utilize when uh, checking patients out. We also have Bluetooth enabled scales that we give all cohort members. And what this is, is there's an app associated with the scale on your phone 
as well as our community health workers phones. And so when they weigh themselves in, uh, that weight gets transferred to the phone and that uh, weight is also available for us to view. Uh, that way we are able to track their different clinical measures um, for both reporting as well as kind of health education and health coaching purposes. And then we also send home um, participants with at-home blood pressure cuffs. And recently we also have gotten a multitude of different uh, cooking instruments that we get to send everyone home with. And that way we're just trying to set them up for success and provide them with all the different resources that they may need. So I went through that a little fast, but I did try to touch on all the different programs we offer. There are a lot. Um, I wanted to give you guys a well-rounded view of what we offer on the wellness side of things. But with that being said, I will stop talking and <laughs> let anybody ask questions that may have some. Yeah, I just want to remind, thank you so much, Madison. That was so informative and so much is happening in the worsening area. Um, please, everyone, put your questions or comments in the chat that you have for Madison. I'm already seeing people say amazing presentation, great stuff. There was certainly a comment early on from, uh, I believe, from Ben that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death and premature death in Ulster County. And of course, you're speaking about higher rates uh, in the Ellenville yes. area. So, you know, this is uh, certainly good information that we're getting. Um, Cindy, uh, uh, yep, I did it again. Christine Noble said uh, great information. And uh, we're seeing that was really great. I'm going to reach out to you. Uh, that came from uh, Ms. Ververo. And then um, had, Kathy Nolan asked, has your ret retention been good in the program despite COVID-19? Yeah, um, it definitely has. I think that, uh, especially with isolation, we're seeing that the majority of the participants are having more com communication, if not um, the same as they were pre-COVID because there's less, especially for our senior population, um, when contact with outside individuals is limited, we're providing them a resource for not only just kind of health education, but also just general communication. So retention has been good. Yeah, I'm curious myself, just, uh, you know, the family's participation, you know, you've got so many mm -hmm. families that you're recruiting and you're finding that that they're able to stay in the program with all the demands of online schooling. Yes, so that's definitely been one of our biggest challenges, I would say, um, not even retention, but more so kind of gearing our, our services towards that population of individuals. Um, Specifically, when we're looking towards like virtual education, we're seeing a lot of burnout in youth, obviously, when they're on a screen all day. So how are we going to be presenting additional health information to them without um, overloading them and getting their interests in general? And then also for caregivers, uh, when is the best time for these programs to happen when they're with their kids all day um, doing virtual schooling and what is the best option there? Um, you have another comment, great presentation from Holly Bruno, very informative, but I also have a question from Emily Flynn. Could you share the link to the ShopRite meal plan on social media? Um, yeah. um, that would be great. Sure, we share that on our current social media. Um, I'll look to share it to this group. And well. Chris, Christine Noble is looking uh, for flyers or brochures uh, that you know could be shared uh, with their office. She's at the Office of the Aging. So um, that's another place I would like to share your brochures. Oh, definitely. Um, probably digitally and paper, I would imagine. Other questions? Yep. Well, I don't see any other questions. I'm just going to say that was really, really informative. As much as I already know about the programs there, I still learn new things. So, um, and uh, Suzanne Callahan just said that Ellenville Regional Hospital is doing great work. The Institute is delighted to be a partner. And I think all of the partners in this project, in the programs, including Cooperative Extension, we're just learning so many new things from, really you're doing this groundbreaking innovative work we all have sort of dreamed of, everything from the pharmacy, uh, you know, to your healthy restaurant work you're gonna embark on. We've all taken stabs at it, but you're actually implementing it there with success. So we're excited about that. Any other questions for Madison? Okay, well, thank you so much for your presentation. I know Madison is going to have to leave a little early uh, from this meeting simply because she does have the pharmacy program this afternoon. Um, yeah. But I wanted to thank her again and uh, bring us all back to 
the meeting. So let me just share my screen again and pull us back up into the PowerPoint. Assuming I can find it. I don't even see it. I may have lost it. So I have to find that for you and we'll bring that back up. Oh, got it here. There we go. It was a different color this time. So I wasn't recognizing it. Um, what I want to ask all of you today uh, before we do our quick stretch break is, uh, you know, we need to always have evaluations for our meetings. We use these to help design future meetings and kind of evaluate how it's going for um, members and participants at, at the council meetings. So feedback is really desired. What I have done, um, let's see, I can't get to my chat box now. I should have done it before I did that. So let me open my chat. I just wanna share with you um, a link to an evaluation form. Um, so if you could possibly click on that, it's a very brief evaluation and um, it's really quick. It's you know basically a check, 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 check. Um, and what that does for us is allows us to take a look at this, uh, how, you, how the meeting worked for you. And you basically click on the link, uh, complete the brief questionnaire, and you have to put the titles of the uh, presentations today, but I put some brief ones there. You can just say Ulster 2040 Report and Rural Health Network, and you're basically checking off boxes. There is a space in the bottom for you to uh, add comments if you like. If you want to do that after the meeting, you don't have to complete it during this time, but I'd like you to at least open it up and get it in your, uh, in your browser so that you can see it. Um, and what I'd like to do next is we're just going to take a moment, uh, being as this is our, our healthy Ulster meeting, we do practice and preach and put our money behind all our healthy meeting protocols. Um, if we were meeting in person, uh, which uh, you know someday we will be again, I am sure, you would be enjoying a healthy snack because we want to emulate and practice all of our meeting behaviors that are healthy. And we would also take some time for a quick uh, movement break. Um, this is always difficult to do while we're online on Zoom. So what I'm really just going to ask everyone to do is you can turn off your camera for a minute, just stand up, stretch. We spend so much time sitting at our computers and we're so sedentary with the work that we're doing right now. I'm gonna give everybody about three minutes. Get up, walk around, shake it off, come sit back down, turn your camera on so I know that you're back. Um, it is right now 3.04, please be back by 3.07. Um, and I will be here the entire time. I'm just gonna stand up for a second myself, but please do stand up, take a quick break and uh, come right back 307. We're, we're going to do all of our network and sharing and everybody gets a chance to share a little bit about their program for the next 20 minutes. So do uh, again, turn your camera off, stand up, stretch. I'm gonna do the same and we'll be back in probably almost two minutes now. And let's just make that happen.
Okay, it's 307 if everybody could return and just turn your cameras on so I know that you're here. We'll just take a quick look see make sure we've got everybody. All right, I hope you took a nice big stretch looked longingly out at the sunshine. <laughs> But we've got um, some the really uh, important part of our meeting at this point, and that's where you all get to share what you're doing in your program. Um, so I just want to go over really quickly our networking rules. So I am the facilitator, and I'm going to call upon all of you to share individually, state your name, the name of your organization, and really briefly share an upcoming event or program that you'd like everyone to know about from your organization. Try to focus on your event or your program rather than the whole organization because you want to be concise. Remember, you can also share details such as your website, program dates in the chat. And the chat does get saved and it's also put uh, on the website and it goes also into meeting notes. So if you have details that you want to put up there, you want websites or you want dates for things that are coming up, please put it in the chat. But when I call upon you again, you're going to state your name, your organization and give us, you know, a really brief uh, event or upcoming program that you've got. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing here and we'll move into that. There we go. So I'm just going to go around um, and it's going to be in the order that I see you. So it may look different on your screen, but I'll start with Marge. Hi, everybody. Um, just wanted to make a note that, especially in the uh, children's daycare industry, that uh, we will be resuming some of the Heart Saver uh, and first aid pediatric trainings that are necessary for the staff. Uh, more to follow on that. Probably it will be in Tuesday evenings, but as the weather gets nicer, we'll be looking to do them in an outside environment, uh, probably actually on my back patio because it makes it uh, very reachable in terms of center of the county. So Tuesdays probably will be starting um, in uh, the first two, not the first two, but the, the first and second Tuesday. Uh, in the month of May, because that way we can do them outside. If anyone has any inside places that, that, that they know of, that's been one of the biggest barriers in doing the class is that it's very difficult uh, to find a place to hold the class. But as the weather nicens, I'm gonna start doing them outside. Thank you, Marge. You might wanna put some contact information in the chat so people can reach sure. out to you. That'd yep. be great. Um, so I'm sorry, you've got the M Varvero and I just can't come up with your first name. That's okay, it's Michelle Barbero. Here this is go. my first meeting. Um, so my name is Michelle Barbero and I'm the regional manager for Children's Health Home of Upstate New York, which is also known as CHUNY. We oversee various agencies throughout the state. We literally cover every, 55 counties. Um, and we are contracted out through Department of Health with a whole new free program um, that is available at a preventative level to help families navigate services, resources, and encourage communication amongst everyone involved with the child's life. This is a free service through Medicaid, and I would be very happy if I could do a presentation because so many children um, and families, I was basically hired. My full-time job is to bounce around the Hudson Valley and the Capital Region and make sure everyone is aware they're eligible for it. Um, make sure that people who are working with children zero through 21 are, you know, know about it so that they can refer people to it. Um, the one other thing I'd like to throw in mainly because of the two presentations today is that I have, um, been making some efforts to reach out more in like Greene County and Ulster County because a lot of our agencies are not located in your counties but providing services in the county. So I'd really like to collaborate. These, um, you know, whether you guys would like to provide care management or have an agency house care management in your agency or school or I was going to reach out to um, Madison for the hospital. 
this is a community-based program that really, um, I don't want to take up all the time, but it's definitely purposeful and there's a lot of room to be creative here. So I'm going to put my contact information in um, the box and I would be happy to talk to anybody about this. Thank you, Michelle. Kathy Nolan. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Um, so a couple of things. Um, I work with Catskill Mountain Keeper. Uh, we're an environmental group that enriches the Catskills. And we're working on um, a bill to ban neonicotinoid insecticides in New York, in treated seeds in New York State. So when the, the insecticide is put on the seed, it goes throughout the plant. You can't wash it off. It shows up in the in foods, including baby foods. Um, any um, fruit or vegetable grown near that near those agents. Neonicotinoid means new nicotine-like, and these are nicotine-like insecticides that we're now feeding to ourselves and our children. Um, they're in about 50% of the U.S. population, and they're in a lot of 30% uh, of, of Long Island groundwater. So I'll bring you more information about that bill as it um, moves forward and seek the um, assistance of these groups to really uh, call on our elected officials to uh, take this action. It'll be pretty dramatic action, but um, pretty dramatic action is needed. And then I uh, just want to say a quick word about uh, Samadhi Community Outreach Center. Uh, this is a center uh, on uh, Clinton Avenue in Kingston for people in recovery or seeking to go into recovery. And we have um, daily programs, um, hundreds of free programs um, each month for people who are in recovery or seeking recovery in a recovery community. And so I put the link to our calendar in the chat. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kathy. Katie Sheehan Lopez. Hi, um, so my name is Katie Sheehan Lopez. I'm the SNEPED Nutrition Educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension. So I provide um, nutrition education to SNAP eligible populations all over Ulster, Columbia and Greene counties. So that could be youth, it could be a classroom, it could be seniors, it could be adults, um, really anyone as long as they're SNAP eligible. And if you have a group that you think would be interested, please let me know. I will put my contact information in the chat and you can always reach out to me um, or Marsha if you are interested in nutrition education. Thanks. Thank you, Carolyn Hurley. Hi, my name is Carolyn Hurley. I'm with Ulster County Habitat for Humanity. I am the Family Services Coordinator and also the Volunteer Coordinator. This is actually my first meeting. Um, and uh, currently, right now, what we are what we are doing is um, is we are in the process of trying to find more partner families. Um, that would criteria for our uh, home ownership program. Um, we're having a little, you know, the Ulster report uh, was very, very interesting. And, you know, we are seeing uh, the cost of land and trying to find land for a home, for our home ownership program. Um, and the cost of our building has built have really um, gone up and the cost of the homes in this area. So we are dealing with this with some of those issues around that too as well. We are looking for land to right now, more land to build. Um, another program we're doing right now is we're in the midst of our women build. Last year we would have been on the build site, but none of our volunteers can come on the build site, but we're doing a virtual women build. So if you can follow us at Facebook and Instagram, and um, there's just, you know, there's some information up there about our Calls of Home Advocacy Program. And maybe I can tell you more about that one at our next meeting, because I really want to do some training with HFHI about that program and bring that locally. So I might have more information about that, our housing advocacy program. Thank you. And Marcia. nice to meet you all. <laughs> Welcome, Marsha. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this was a great meeting, um, all of the presenters, and um, nice to see everyone. Uh, my name is Marsha, and I um, work with Katie. I'm a nutrition educator. I provide uh, an eight-week series of um, uh, 
uh, family nutrition education. Right now, um, the series is done online. It's for an hour um, a week. Um, and my target audience uh, is low income um, uh, parents with children under the age of 19 who are eligible for SNAP, uh, WIC, free or reduced school lunch. Um, and I'll put my information in the chat box. The second and uh, fourth Tuesday every month at 4.30, uh, I do an FNAP um, orientation. It's about 20 minutes. Um, and you can even uh, like self-refer um, any clients. They can sign up online at our FNAP page and find out more about the program. So I'll put that in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Suzanne Callahan. Oh, hi, everyone. I'm Susanna Callahan from the Institute for Family Health. Um, just quickly, we just launched um, a web page, a landing page on our um, on our website um, for uh, uh, medication assisted treatment for people with opioid use disorders. We're really excited about this. Actually, it was a little grant from the Healing Community Study um, from the county. And actually, it was just, I mean, it's just hot off the press. And, and we're hoping that it helps link people um, you know, with opioid use disorders or family members, friends, et cetera, with our two um, substance use care navigators who will link people directly to, to our staff to make quick appointments to get them in for integrated primary care and medication assisted um, treatment. So we're really excited. I'll put the link if I can figure out how to do this in the, um, in the chat room. So um, yes, we're very excited about this. And Vin, I thought you'd want to hear that too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Patricia Dingman. Sorry, you caught me taking notes. <laughs> so I'm Patricia Dingman from Ulster County BOCES. Um, connecting with you all has been wonderful. This is great. Um, what we're doing on our end educationally as far as um, health and wellness is we're continuing our CNA programs. So we've got one that is running right now. We have another cohort that will be starting mid to late April. Uh, we've got a new cohort of surgical technologist training coming in the fall because we have people currently in that program. We're also trying to focus on what you have all been focusing on with food, which is more healthy meals. So we have two of our chefs from the high school. We'll be doing six chef de jour classes over April, May, and June. And we're also offering the serve safe training in April and June, so that if anyone is looking to work in the restaurant business or some kind of food prep, even as a volunteer, they would have that certification. And then that goes along with all the rest of our uh, career things that we have going on. We still have welding and um, heating, air conditioning, electrical, and we have our HSE and ESL classes for those who need those as well. Thank you, Patricia. Thanks. I'll throw things in the chat. Yes, and I remind everyone to please utilize the chat to also share contact information. Holly Bruno. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly Bruno. I'm from the Red Cross in the Hudson Valley chapter. Um, so I'm a disaster preparedness associate. So what we are doing right now is we're looking for partner agencies who want to, you know, co-host one of our events for emergency preparedness. Now we cover youth, we cover um, the little kids, you know, kindergarten through second grade, we have third grade through sixth grade, and then um, our high schoolers and adults, we have um, programs for each of them. And that would be like a Zoom format, obviously virtual, and uh, we supply all the materials. Great. Thank you. I'm Barbara. Barbara, we'll move on. Uh, give Barbara a minute to get there. Lailani uh, Yizar Reed, and please let me know if I pronounced your name wrong. Just correct me. It's okay. It's uh, Leilani Yizar Reed. And Thank you. I, no worries. I am the team leader for the Mid Hudson Problem Gambling Resource Center. And this month, March is Problem Gambling Awareness Month. So we are, we have been posting a lot on social media. We, um, I will too put the link in the chat for where you are able to go to the New York 
problem gambling on uh, New York problem gambling.org to find all your PGAM needs. If you are able to with whatever organization that you work with, um, there is a screening toolkit to try to identify those who may be struggling. And um, we also rolled out a new e screener for any person who wants to self identify or, you know, question themselves, they're able to uh, utilize the e screener and call us in the mid Hudson region if they need help. Again, this is a whole New York State. Um, New York Council on Problem Gambling has uh, resource centers throughout the whole New York State, so you can find us anywhere. Also, uh, there are support groups for families who are affected. Every second Thursday, which is tonight, um, starts, I believe, at 8 o'clock. There is a, um, a support group for families who are affected by a, their loved one's gambling addiction. Um, at all times, if you know any person who needs help, please give us a call. If they're unable to pay through um, through uh, their insurance or out of pocket, we do try to cover the cost. So um, we try to have no barriers to care. That's Thank it. you, Leilani. You're welcome. Um, Christine Noble. Hi, everybody. Um, right now, our office, I'm Christine Noble from the Office for the Aging, Senior Aging Services Aid. And I just wanted to let you know, we're doing some online learning for seniors. Um, in oh, March 18th, we have a no bake granola bar. <laughs> Our Office for Aging Registered Dietitian is going to do that from noon to two o'clock. Our online learning presentations are. We have a couple other ones. You can look on our website for them, but I thought it fits right in with today. And then also, uh, our office is taking names and phone numbers and addresses of homebound seniors where the health, de we're going to turn the list over to the health department. And they will be getting um, registered nurses to go out to the homes to give the vaccine. So it, they would call our main number at our office to um, report the name and uh, phone number of a homebound senior, someone that cannot get out. So that's basically what I needed to uh, talk about today. I hope everybody stays safe. Thank you, Melinda. Thank the you. Presentations were excellent today. Well, thank you so much, Christine, and that's really good information about homebound seniors. I appreciate you sharing that and the work that you do. Vin. Hi. So we, um, as uh, Kathy mentioned briefly, um, Samadhi, you know, Samadhi's doing tremendous work on the ground in, in Kingston, providing fabulous services, but we've really dramatically ramped up our um, opioid prevention uh, and uh, linkages to treatment programs through vastly increased distribution of Narcan, um, vastly increased the number of providers providing medication assisted treatment. Uh, there, there's a new website that we just launched that lists all the providers. Um, we are getting our high risk mitigation teams up and running. These are the teams of uh, social workers, care managers, um, peer advocates that are working with individuals on the path to recovery through the multi-year process of treatment and recovery with a, a database system that's been developed to follow them every step of the way and make sure that they don't slip into the cracks of between programs and treatments. Um, and I can really go on and on uh, with this. We also have a, a big big grant from the National Association of County Health Officials, NHO, uh, where we're going to be creating a peer-to-peer student-driven uh, um, communications, prevention communications campaign. It's a huge project um, lasting through June 22, where students from all over Ulster County will be participating in creating uh, media messaging designed to discourage um, substance use, experimentation, to um, promote proactive alternatives to substance use. And we're very excited about that because we also have a huge budget to push that campaign out onto all media platforms for an extended period of time. So we're working on all fronts. Um, COVID has definitely um, impacted our numbers um, in the wrong direction, but we think that once the pandemic subsides that the substantial programs we put in place will really begin to drive those numbers way down. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think we got everyone. Um, I, if 
anybody didn't go, just pop your video on, but I'm pretty sure we had everybody speak. And thank you so much for sharing all this valuable information again. Um, I encourage you to use the chat and remember that most of you, if you haven't been invited to Google Groups, the Healthy Ulster Google Group, uh, please send me an email. I'll put my email in the chat and I will invite you, but you should be a member of that now. Once you register for one of these meetings, you are invited. That's another place that you can use to share your information with other members of the council. So if you have upcoming workshops, upcoming events, programs, you wanna share flyers, you can send that out yourself on the Healthy Ulster Council Google group. So do be sure to utilize that. That's a tool of our, our membership. Um, so we have come to the point in the meeting where I just basically want to um, bring to your attention uh, the next meeting. So let me just bring this up. Um, so our next Healthy Ulster Council meeting will be held Thursday, May 13th from 2 to 3.30 p.m. And uh, if you want more information on our uh, council, you can visit that at healthyulstercounty.org and lots of other useful information on healthy activities in Ulster County. Um, please take a look at that. And yes, do utilize the Healthy Ulster Google group a membership that you have because that's another way to communicate and extend our networking session. I cannot say enough how useful these meetings are to me in my work and I hope that they're um, helpful and useful to all of you. Um, if you need more information, here is my contact information and also Stacy Kraft of the Ulster County Department of Health and Mental Health. You can reach out to either of us um, for more information and if you're interested in presenting at a meeting. So I'll leave that there for a few minutes, but I just want to thank you all for your participation today. Um, really, it's, uh, this is what we're all about. Uh, and the networking session really brings us to life so that you know, we know what each other's work is doing. Um, so thank you. My gosh, it's such a gorgeous day out there. I hope you all get a chance to pop your head out the door and enjoy some sunshine. I know that's my first order of business. So I want to get that sun before it goes down. And remember, this is the weekend we change our clocks and get more light after work. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for all, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.